welcome to Bronx Talk. Election Day coming up on November 8. Early voting has begun and absentee ballots must be postmarked by November 7th and received by November 15th. Tonight we thought we would take a unique approach to supporting voter literacy with two separate forums, one with Republican conservative candidates and the other with Democratic candidates. We're covering the races in the 80th and 81st Assembly Districts and the 34th Senatorial District. Tonight, we start off with three Republican conservative candidates in those districts. So let me introduce them to you. Please join me in welcoming the Republican and conservative candidate in the open seat for the 80th Assembly District, a school teacher, Phyllis Tiz Nastasio. Ms. Nastasio, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having us. Uh, running on the conservative line, he's a freelance filmmaker. It is Kevin Pasmino. Nice to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me back, uh, Gary. And uh, joining us on Skype this evening, you'll be able to see her right over on my left shoulder, the Republican conservative candidate running in the 34th Senatorial District, the owner of insurance and construction businesses. It is Samantha Zerka. Ms. Zerka, nice to have you with us. Same here. Thank you for having me. Um, folks, let's just start going around the room, let people know who you are, why you decided to um, seek uh, elected office. Uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Nastasio. Uh, let's talk about uh, your interest in the 80th Assembly District. Well, I'm a school teacher. First of all, I'm a Bronxite. Born and raised in the Bronx, always lived in the same area. Um, I teach at St. Francis Xavier, which is in the 80th. I sit on my community board on the public safety committees and the education committees. I'm a executive board member of my precinct council. And I just felt it was time to step up and try to fix everything that's gone wrong in our community. Thank you very much. Mr. Pasmino, your thought? Uh, yeah, so um, I live up here in uh, North Riverdale. Uh, and I am, as mentioned earlier, I'm an independent filmmaker, uh, DGA, first, first assistant director. Uh, I got involved basically because, you know, I, I have four children and uh, over the past, you know, like 15 years now, I've been watching the Democratic Party and uh, a lot of people on the left kind of destroy our state, our city. And frankly, I just, I couldn't stand back and just, you know, yell at the TV anymore. I felt like I needed to get involved <laughs> and uh, make sure to stand up for, um, you know, and I, and I say Democratic Party, when I say, when I, anytime I talk against the Democrats, I'm always talking about the party itself and the institution, not the people. Um, you know, I just felt like, uh, you know, that there's been this uh, two-party system that's kind of, uh, is kind of here to divide us and it, it sometimes takes away how much we have in common and whatnot. But uh, so I, I kind of just wanted to be a, a voice for the conservatives. Uh, got involved in 2020 when I met uh, Patrick McManus and uh, the chairman of the Bronx Conservative Party. And, uh, you know, the party's, you know, it's, it's, it's lean. And uh, but, you know, we're we're doing the best we can to stand up for, for freedom and for the Constitution and whatnot. Um, so that's why I'm running. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Zerka, um, what are your thoughts? Oh, well, my thoughts are, first off, my name is Samantha Zerka, and I'm a proud daughter of Albanian immigrants who suffered at the hands of communism Albania. Um, they spent uh, many years imprisoned in camps and tortured by communism. Um, one of my reasons why I stepped out to run is that I will never lose sight of what my parents went through in order to come to this wonderful country called America. Um, in 2021, I took my daughter to Florida to educate her. Um, here in New York, we were under draconian mandates. I took her to Florida and saw a completely stark difference with the way um, the Floridians were uh, living versus the way we were living here in New York, and that was the beginning of the turning fire in my belly, that something was absolutely rogue and wrong with the way we were being handled here in New York. Um, it is why, it was one of the reasons why I stepped out. The other is obviously crime. I'm a mother of a child, I'm a mother who lost a child when he was 17 years old. I know the pain and I know the suffering and every single day for the past year, if not longer, we have been witnessing children being killed, whether it's by gun violence or knifing, whatever it is, our children are not reared and, you know, sent out into society to be murdered and killed. And this, the, the bail reform is precisely what has caused it. And it's why I'm stepping out to run to change things for the betterment of our, our, our community. Well, right at the top of my list is crime. And so uh, we'll get right back to you then. And let's talk about um, if you are elected to uh, the New York State Senate, 
how would you fight crime? What, what would you do uh, to change the tide and turn things around? One of the first things I would do is re uh, push to repeal the bail reform. It is nonsensical. It is not the way we conduct, uh, you know, uh, setting setting a, a discipline out there as far as fixing the problems that are, are, are broken. You know, the bail reform has caused a vacuum of crime. It has not fixed any intended issue that the Democrats had projected or purported to be an issue. Um, the second thing would be to uh, fund the police. We need more funding to our police. They should not have been vilified for stepping out and conducting, you know, their safety measures for the public. You know, they step out every single day. Their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, their, and their sons and daughters. And they step out of their home every single day to protect the people. And they should have never been vilified that way. So funding the police, bringing back resources that they need, in fact, possibly even giving them a raise for the, the terrible de demoralization they've suffered for the past few years. You know, we can't say that, you know, we can't say that an entire apple orchard is, 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 is um, defective because there's two or three apples found in that orchard to be defective. You know, this the, you, we don't operate an entire government on the basis of two or three wrong things. We look to find the pieces that are broken and we fix them. All the while, we preserve life because that is the first duty of government. The first duty of government is the protection of life. And our government today has failed that. And we can account for that because there are an increase and victimization these past couple of years that should have never been there. So it's less for the for the for the criminal and more for the uh, law abiding citizen. We'll, we'll go around the room and get everybody's impression. Let me just uh, let, let's pursue this idea of um, bail reform. Uh, crime is all up all over the country. I mean, we saw a shooting in a, a Dallas hospital just the other day. Uh, there was um, a shooting uh, in Connecticut. There have been shootings all over the place. You know, there's no bail reform there. Uh, why would you say that bail reform here is the cause of uh, uh, the, the uh, rise in crime? And let's note that um, murders and um, gun use is down in uh, the city of New York, whereas uh, lower level, so-called, I'm not minimizing any crime, lower level crimes uh, in, in um, uh, neighborhoods, are, in delis and bodegas and things like that are up. Um, how does bail reform affect those things? Well, if there's no ramification or consequence that a criminal is is going to face, then the crime, the recidiv the recidivism is going to increase. Bail reform is a direct result. Rate of rape has gone up ten percent. I'm a woman, and I know my vulnerability. And when we see women being raped in the broad daylight, then we obviously have a concern with the bail reform laws that are in place. Bail reform laws have also tied the hands of prosecutors and have also tied the hands of judges. So if we're going to fix what's broken, we start off by repealing the bail reform to bring back safety to, our, to the people, to women. What about the senior citizens who are being assaulted in their place of residence in the South Bronx? Why should they have to, you know, be... You know, victimized that way and other seniors who have, you know, uh, 14 or 15 people knocking at their door and terrorizing them at night. So bail reform is an issue. You know, you're so, saying but, that. But the, let, uh, let, me, let me just ask you this and, and we'll let everybody else weigh in. And this will be the last one for you on this. Um, the whole notion of bail reform is not because they're criminals. It's because they've been arrested and our Constitution said innocent till proven guilty. People like Harvey Weinstein paid a million dollars bail and got out, even though um, obviously now he's been identified pretty clearly as a, as a criminal. Yet somebody else um, who may be accused of the same thing but doesn't have the million dollars that he has is going to spend the time in Rikers. Is, is that fair to that person? You know, I, I, that, to me, that's all spin. Here's, what, here's how spin. I see it. It's spin. It's spin. We, there is a constitutional right. OK, and no one's talking about taking away that right. Everybody has a constitutional right. Um, and, and this is not the issue here. What the issue is measuring the consequences that a victim faces compared to that of the per perpetrator who, who, who committed that. You know, if you're looking at rape, let's take rape for an example. You know, women today have been victimized. The, the, the level of rape 
today with women is extremely high. So are we supposed to sit there and, and, and have uh, sympathy for the perpetrator or do we have sympathy well, for the women? We had, my, my we had sympathy women, for rich perpetrators because Harvey Weinstein uh, got to go back out. Money. We're not talking money here. What we're talking about is well, the that is what of bail, That is what money. bail is, is money. All right, let, let's okay. just bring in the others. I don't, I don't want to have you dominate. First. Ms. Nastasio, like you're... To yeah, I'm yes. sure you would. Go right ahead. The problem is... If you're a first-time offender, okay, then I can see it. But these are repeat offenders that are constantly being let out without bail. Some 50, 60 times have been arrested, and still it's the revolving door. As fast as they go in, they come right back out. So the money business where this guy's rich, this guy's poor, that's, that really doesn't work unless it's a first-time offender. Harvey Weinstein, if I'm not mistaken, was a first-time offender. At that time, yes. Yes. Right. But we're letting out people and, who are repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. and, and police officers say that they are demoralized because Absolutely. they say, I just arrested that guy for, for whatever, the paperwork for is stealing He's in out. a bodega, yes. and then I just saw him on yes. the street. I the sit on the day. precinct council, so I know what the comp stat numbers are. Crime might be down in the city overall, but not in the Bronx, not in our area. Um, Crime is up. Mr. Pazmino, your thoughts on this? Sure. Well, you know, the question was uh, how we fight, p potentially you fight crime. You want to start on a general thing? Sure. Yeah, Go sure. Ahead. So, um, well, because I think that the my approach to it is threefold. Uh, the first off, I think we're, we need to pull back a lot of these this far left uh, progressive, you know, bail reform, less is more, uh, this whole ideology of, of uh, underfunding our DAs. Um, so there's a, there's a whole movement right now to kind of like, take the teeth out of law enforcement and kind of basically just handicap the, the, the criminal justice system and, and overall. So I think that's the first and foremost is roll all that back. Uh, secondly, I would, I would want to kind of divide uh, what's what I call organized crime and have that be really what the main you know, police officers, the jails, Rikers, that kind of stuff should all be for organized crime, gangs, cartels, and all that kind of mafia work, anything that's organized crime. And then I think that we need to start implementing more of hospital slash uh, a jail that's more of like a hospital for treatment and whatnot, because a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, when you, nine times out of 10, I believe that when you're, someone's getting arrested, first time offenders is because they're drunk, because they're high, they're on drugs. So, and then those drugs as well lead to mental illness over time of just consistently doing drugs and whatnot. So, which it, may even be the origin of why they committed crime in the first place. Exactly, place. exactly. And then organ too far gone into the mental illness where now it's like they really, really need treatment and, and need to be kind of supervised more so. So, if we can get the people who are DWIs and the people who are doing things just because they're on drugs or they have mental illnesses and put them through a different system where they're getting treated for, for these for their, their illness, then I think we're going to see a drop in, in crime and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. that, that's, so I think that separating health crimes caused by mental illness and drug use from the, 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 you know, the, the uh, revolving door criminal element at professional criminal, which is you know, the cartels, the gangs, the mafia, and everybody that, and, and that benefit from the wars. Mm -hmm. and, and repeat which offenders. Was, exactly. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, thirdly for that would also just be education because you stop kids before you know get get them get them engaged keep them busy so it, extra extracurricular activities sports and that, that of course requires funding it does it does 100 percent. and so if you are elected that would be a priority for you 100 percent. 100 percent. yeah um I, I you you know that you sent me your campaign platform yeah, which I, I read through very carefully one of the things you talked about was the implementation of constitutional carry mm -hmm. uh how does that jive with the idea of lowering crime if we have more people carrying guns. I mean, I, I know I wouldn't want to sit on the subway or a bus knowing that anybody could be having a gun. And I'm sure a police officer doesn't want to walk into a bar knowing that there could be guns all over the place. How many crimes are committed by people who actually go through the proper system of getting the, the, that permit to do it? You know, like it's criminals are the ones who are, who are like I said, either doing it because they're on drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, and whatnot, or they're just a part of the criminal element. They're people who break the law regardless, aren't gonna go through the process of, of getting, it's not easy to get a uh, you know, concealed carry permit. It's very hard. So I don't believe that, I feel that the, the majority of people who would go through that right process are usually using their guns at, at a range and whatnot, or they're a part of law enforcement or security systems to some, to some extent. Mm -hmm. I, especially in this state, I, don't, I think very, very few that actually have uh, constitutional carry are actually just like, the, so in, your, in order, your, your blue collar guy We have guy other things we wanna get to. I sure, don't wanna sure. spend more time on it. Sure. In order to do that, you would need to step up the regulation of who gets a permit for a gun. Well, I mean, I think we have, we have regulation in place. To, there is a process to get a controlled carry, uh, sorry, concealed carry permit. There right. already is one in place. 
So mm-hmm. to, to deny that and try to, which was, seems what's happening right now is completely, there's no, you can't have guns anywhere right. and whatnot. So it's, to me, that's, that is infringing on your constitutional right to protect right. yourself and your, and your family. Ms. Nastasio, yes. um, in your part of the um, uh, Bronx, uh, there's been quite a controversy over the Just Home proposal, mm-hmm. uh, which would uh, give formerly incarcerated uh, the opportunity to live in a uh, facility that would be on the grounds of a Jacoby Medical Center. Sounds to me like that's similar to what uh, Mr. Pesmino is talking about. Um, how do we deal with the influx of migrants who are here, uh, the homeless population was, which is exploding, still build, build affordable housing, not necessarily for that project, but in general, the Bruckner project uh, also uh, received a, a lot of opposition. Um, how do we build affordable housing for all of these different communities that have great needs right. in the borough of the Bronx? Affordable housing doesn't have to be eight stories high. We can follow the density of a community, the zoning that's already in place. We don't need to upzone. And if we do upzone, we need to add infrastructure. We need to add schools. Now, on Bruckner, they're upzoning that area. They're not giving any new schools. The schools are already crowded as it is. So they want to keep piling people into our communities around here, especially around the Marshall Lou Norwood area. They're building in every square inch that they can possibly build. But they're not giving us anything in return. They're not adding schools. They're not adding community centers. They're not fixing the infrastructure. So what are we doing here? It sounds like you're looking for a larger plan as opposed to a project, let's build housing here. Yeah. And right. then if they do that, you like that, uh, you, you would say, well, the plan works, the community's engaged, that's what, that's what your agenda is. You need is. community engagement. If we wanted to live in Manhattan, we would live in Manhattan amongst all the buildings. Why don't we have the right to own a private house and have a backyard that our children can play in. Why are they trying to squeeze us all out to ch- and changing our zoning? One side note, um, we're gonna run out of time way too quickly. <laughs> um, the, the dialogue about that Just Home thing got out of hand. I mean, there was a, a moment even where you had held your hand up in front of somebody's camera. Uh, what happened because there? How did it go I will from, explain that. I think that person was filming a private conversation. He had a small camera on his jacket and walked into a private conversation to film them. He had no right to do that. That is illegal. Okay. That's why I did put my hand over his camera. Makes sense. Ms. Zerka, I'm curious, you started off by talking about your family's um, uh, immigrant origins. Does it make you be more sympathetic to migrants who are here uh, and need a place uh, to stay? and, and uh, want to, uh, if you are elected to the state Senate, say, look, we've got to figure out how to handle them and, and give them a, a better care uh, than they received in their home countries? I'm sympathetic towards the legal process. My mother spent three and a half years in, in, in refugee camps. They were actually communist camps back then. And my father spent 11 and a half years tortured. He was tortured. I'm, I'm and so sorry, eventually- and nobody deserves that, obviously. Right. Eventually, they went to Italy where they were given a lottery to come into this country. They went to Ellis Island and they came into this country legally. They never received a single red penny of government assistance. In fact, my entire family, including myself, we were very poor up until we as children began to work. I started working when I was 11 years old. So my position would be New York residents, citizens of this state and country first. We have much to fix. But for I, our so own. my question was: Would you be more sympathetic to their plight because of this a very difficult background that you've described? Okay, I, I don't understand. I don't understand the plight that they have. So they're all coming here claiming that they're seeking asylum. But what is happening in the, in the state of Mexico, or in Guatemala? Well, it's it's or Venezuela. Wherever. They're coming from Venezuela, and they've been persecuted. And it, and so are we, are we sure they're all coming from Venezuela? Because that is I mean, where the majority uh, of the people who've been bust here have been coming from, yes, that's true. Okay, so my position would be the same as it was with my mother and father. They need to come legally and apply for the asylum process through the proper channels, 
wait in their country and come in the way everyone else has come into this country. I, I want to uh, get to uh, another topic. We'll start with you, Ms. Uh, Zerka. Um, last week, the mayor unveiled a plan to build a wall on the Lower East Side to prevent against the potential storm surges that we had in Hurricane Sandy. Of course, in the East Bronx, which you are very familiar with, the concerns are dire with shoreline communities of City Island and Throgs Neck. The Environmental Bond Act that's on the ballot this year would provide $4.2 billion of infrastructure support. Is this the best way to finance it, or does this kind of funding put the state behind the eight ball financially? And uh, what else should be done to stem the tide, pardon the pun, uh, uh, of climate change so that especially East Bronx communities can do better? Well, I would say, you know, for me, data is bliss. I would have to review the data. I'm a data person. I'm also an insurance adjuster. I handled over 360 claims during Storm Sandy, 280 during um, Storm Irene. And my overall experience has put me about 50,000 claims into this. So as far as claims and I I infrastructure is concerned, we're always going to need to revamp and take care of the infrastructure that's already declining in our communities. Is this project here, I'm not too familiar with it. So what, what I would need is data. I'm all about data, empirical data. And with that, a, a proper decision would be made that would be most effective for the community at, 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 that we're discussing. What, what my question suggested, Mr. Pasmino, is the state and the state budget and the uh, economics of the state with sure. uh, inflation soaring, with prices of gas soaring. Um, how do you view something like that? Is that what we need to do? Or is there another way to get things done without, um, you know, running the state's budget out of control? Well, I think that we're, we're better off tethering any of like the, the major state funds to real world assets because just doing what well, my fear is. And I think most taxpayers fear is, is that government and big government misspends our tax dollars. And I'm a firm believer that if you make less than $300,000 a year, you shouldn't be worried about an audit. Like if anything, the government should be giving the taxpayer an itemized breakdown of every cent that they're paying into the system and where it's being spent and how it's being sent. And, and for every bill that we just willy nilly just sign, or here's a two billion for this or whatever it is, two, three children, trillion for that, every single dollar needs to be tracked and traced so that we know that it's being spent properly. Because there's issues that need to be solved. You know, like, I, I, yes, I'm a part of the conservative party, which means that I have family values, which means I take care of my family. No matter what their walk of life is, I'm there to take care of them and, and try to help them and whatnot. So, but I'm also not gonna just, you know, starve myself because they keep on mismanaging the money too. I'm not gonna just, I'm gonna cut that, that faucet off. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're tracking the money and we know that it's being spent properly and not being just given to like special interest groups or my, my you know, this, some politician's best friend's company where they're just, you know, making, some, making a nice fat salary for themselves and the actual work's not being done for the people, then that's where we can, it just becomes a, 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 a moot conversation to have because we're, we're, what we're talking about is accountability. So if we can actually genuinely know that the money is being spent where it needs to be spent, and mainly at the end of the day, it's infrastructure. That's that's the issue. So m part of my platform is a 10, 10 year zoning, uh, up zoning freeze while we fix the quality of life in New York, the infrastructure, you know, so that's drainage. For systems. these kinds of things. For so these kinds of things. Shorelines is what yeah. I was and then And then we work but with other assembly districts to build out further upstate and whatnot. Let's let Ms. Nastasio, sure. let's talk about budgets um, and, and really how government handles money uh, in relation to uh, inflation and the pressure that we all feel to get prices we can afford. Well, I don't have the coastline in my district, but I do have the biggest sinkhole we've had in recent history on Radcliffe Avenue. It all goes back to infrastructure. Those streets, all the streets that were recently redone with new gas lines are the ones that are all collapsing. So who is following these companies? Where are these companies coming from? Are they friends of politicians that are getting hired to do these, um, this construction work? So, so what, what you're saying is uh, the process and uh, the allocation process is of concern to you. Absolutely. Look at the Buffalo Bill Stadium. How much money is going there? $850 million to be mm -hmm. precise. How can you properly manage a budget if you don't know how it's being spent? Yeah. And that's, I think that's the biggest problem with, that we have in government in terms of like, then you start painting it as if, oh, you don't care and, and you're heartless and you don't want to solve these so societal problems. Right. And they're no, not just, solving the problems. Yeah, exactly. I reported a sinkhole July 4th on, in my community. I don't, I don't want to start counting the months. Uh, it's still <laughs> there and it's alongside a school. So if that goes, it's going to take part that, of the school a, with that's it. That's a very that's big That's a big problem. concern. 
Uh, I've reported it to uh, DEP. They know about it. I've reported to our councilwoman. She knows about it. Nothing's getting done. Uh, I, that's really the last question. I want to go around the room. We'll start with you, Ms. Nastasio. Um, we haven't had a, a Republican elected official in the Bronx since mm -hmm. Guy Vallela, and he uh, left office in 2004. Why is this the right time for um, Republican philosophies uh, in the borough of the Bronx, uh, in, in your mind, even though uh, I mean, certainly the numbers would show there are many fewer Republicans mm -hmm. than there are Democrats. Um, let's, we'll give you each a chance to make your well, pitch. Well, I ahead. have the endorsement of many of the Democrat community leaders in the 80th. So I think even Democrats, moderate Democrats, are fed up with the way our city is being run. And they want to change. And this is time for the change. Okay, Mr. Pasmino, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm echoing Tizzy's point. I mean, you know, the Democratic Party has shifted so far left that moderates are pretty much completely out of the picture. So, and, and you, you have to understand, like, we're all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're red state uh, Republicans or conservatives. It's we're New Yorkers. I'm a Bronx conservative. So it's not like my idea. I, I'm, I lean, I'm pretty much I'm a moderate for the most part. You know what I mean? They're, you know, I have my views on, on both sides of the spectrum and whatnot. So, but the, the left and the Democratic Party has gone so far, to the, so far left that, you're, you're basically isolating and eliminating like the voice of, of the majority of the people. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Zerka, my sense is you're uh, the most out, would be the most outspoken on this particular uh, subject. And so uh, maybe uh, you can have the final word on the program about this. Why is it time that a Republican conservative gets elected to the state Senate in the Bronx? Because we have about two decades of one party rule in the state of New York, and that party is the Democrat Party. The party has not done anything that's that's to the benefit of the people. They go to Albany and they lose sight of the constituents and the residents within their communities. They promise them things and deliver them nothing other than free turkeys that, by the way, we pay for with our tax <laughs> dollars. It's time that we bring trade schools back to our, our high schools. It's time that we bring vocational studies. It's time that we stop the vicious cycle of poverty and it begins by investing in our children's future. They are going to be our tomorrow. We need to address the crime. We need to address a hell of a lot of things in our state that have fallen off the wayside by way of this power that the Democrats have had for I, far too long. I, I don't want to cut you off, but we're almost out of time. But do you want to have one last sentence real quick? Or you've already yes, said what you need. It's time to turn the tide of times and bring a balance of both Democrat, Republican to Albany Got so it. that we can bring our state back to where it was and better. Great. Samantha Zerka from the uh, 34th um, Senatorial District, good luck in your campaign. Uh, Tiz so Nastasio, good luck in your campaign Thank in you. the 80th. And uh, Kevin Pasmino, good luck to you in the 81st. Thanks. And uh, don't go away. We'll be right back with more Bronx Talk right after this. Okay, welcome back to Bronx Talk. We continue now with the Democratic candidates running in the 80th, 81st Assembly Districts and the 34th Senatorial District. Running in the open seat for the 80th Assembly District is the current Chief of Staff of Council Member Rafael Salamanca, Jr. It is John Zaccaro, Jr. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Gary. The incumbent in the 81st Assembly District is Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz. Assemblyman, nice to have you with us, Good sir. Good to be here. And she is currently the Assembly Member in the 80th Assembly District, but she's the Democratic candidate in the 34th Senatorial District. It is Assembly Member Natalia Fernandez. Assembly Member, nice to have you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Mr. Zaccaro. Um, people generally know uh, Assemblyman uh, Dinowitz and Assembly member um, Fernandez, but who are you? Why did you decide to run? Why it, do you see yourself as this time? Um, uh, what, you know, he, here you are. Let's uh, present at least, uh, take about a minute and tell us who you are. Well, thank you so much, first, Gary, for having me on the show. I'm a 33-year-old Bronx born and bred. 
um, Bronx side here. And at a critical time where we're facing housing insecurity, where we're facing inflation, where the economy is going down, um, now more than ever do we need experienced leaders who can tackle the issues of today um, and have the foresight to handle the issues of tomorrow. And I've done that as, as a member of this community for 33 years. I've committed my entire adult um, career to public service, starting in the city council as an intern in 2009, um, and did a short time at the Department of Education um, in the Intergovernmental Affairs Office, and then back at the city council uh, for now land use chair, city council member Salamanca, where I have gotten the immense pleasure of serving the Bronx in many capacities and addressing issues of quality of life and addressing affordable housing in the Bronx and uplifting communities in education. Um, I have the experience, I have the leadership that it takes to take on this role and to handle the issues that we're serving, to, we're dealing with today. I'm a father of three uh, who raised my kids in this community. My kids utilize the public school system. My kids um, go to the, the local parks. We patronize the businesses in this community. We talk to our neighbors. We understand the issues. My ears have been to the ground for many, many, many years on the issues that are affecting people every day. Um, and I've never been more than ready to take on this role and advocate for my community. Well, thank you very much. Of course, good luck in your campaign. Thank you. Let, we, we had said we were going to talk about issues, so let's start with issues. Assemblyman, let's start with you. Let's talk about the crime. Uh, murders and shootings are down, uh, though other major crimes are up, including robbery, burglary, and grand larceny. Local delis and bodegas are feeling the pinch maybe more than anybody else. Um, how do we deal with it? And what, what can the state legislature do uh, if you are reelected to go back to Albany uh, to deal with this problem that uh, affects really all of us? Well, we have done a lot of work from our end. We've passed a number of important bills dealing with the issue of guns because guns are overrunning this state, both legal and especially illegal guns, and that's a really key part of fighting crime. Um, the, you're right, the, the most serious crimes, they have gone down in the past year. Other crimes have gone up. I think one thing everybody should understand is that the whole world has gone crazy s since the pandemic. Crime is up all over the country. It's not a New York phenomenon. Uh, you know, you would think so reading one of the tabloid newspapers, but the fact is crime is up everywhere, particularly in red states, and that does we have to deal with it, and we are dealing with it. Uh, we made changes to the, uh, the bail laws this past mo uh, April, uh, and we've taken another, uh, a number of other steps. I think the mayor is trying to crack down on, on some of these uh, issues that we're dealing with. For the district that I represent, the, the biggest number of complaints we get is over the, I'll call them quality of life type crimes, you know, the drag racing, the scooters on the sidewalks, things like that. Uh, we've been relatively fortunate that we haven't had as many of the serious crimes, but vast areas of the Bronx have, and it cannot continue that and, way. And so what happens? It's a matter of um, e either from the state, um, you can somehow legislate, um, whether it be budget for uh, police officers, uh, working with your council members, uh, you know, how, how do you deal with those quality of life crimes? Well, we've put on the state level uh, large amounts of money that go to the district attorney's offices, for example. Uh, in terms of my own district, I've provided a quarter of a million dollars funding to the Kingsbridge Heights Community Center, a quarter of a million to Marshall Montefiore for programs to try to make sure that teenagers don't get into the wrong things in the first place. So there are a lot of different things we have to do relating to education, but we, we have to support uh, the work of the police. You know, one of my opponents uh, was a supporter of defund the police. I've always been opposed to that. We cannot be cutting down on the funding for the police at a time when crime is so high. So it's really a uh, a lot of different things that we have to do at the same time. Assemblymember uh, Fernandez, um, let's talk about bail reform. It's, it's a, um, a flashpoint issue. Um, how much does bail reform uh, contribute to the rise in crime? Uh, it was uh, uh, reformed once. Does it need to be reformed again? There are many, uh, certainly on the Republican side, uh, who are saying, you know what, we don't even like it at all. Let's eliminate what was done in the beginning. Um, what, what's your point of view on, bail, on the bail reform that was done? We need to do more. Where is it at? Um, well, I think we made huge steps in accomplishing it in the first place because for generations and since the beginning of our criminal justice system, we saw how the old bail reform system was uh, criminalizing poverty. People committing the same crime could possibly commit again because they were able to pay uh, for their freedom the first time. So 
in accomplishing that, I think that's a good thing. We have seen the numbers continue to raise of people returning back to court. Do our courts need to move faster? Absolutely, to prevent a possible second attempt. And the law does say that if there is a second crime committed in between that waiting period, then bail can be posted. So I think that we need to apply the law better because we see some cases that judges haven't been charging um, in ways that they can. And uh, we need the courts to speed up. Police officers are saying, many police officers are saying, you know what, I arrest somebody for, you know, a, a relatively low level quality of life crime and uh, the next thing we know they're back on the street uh, shortly. Well, that was happening that before bail reform and that's something that we must constantly remind because yes, the petty crimes, someone stealing uh, items from the bodega shelf, they were getting arrested and getting re-released before bail reform. So I think we need to look at why, since before <laughs> bail reform, that's been happening because it's continuing to happen. Uh, uh, can I assume, and we'll go around, and, and certainly Mr. Zakara will give you a chance as well, that you're all uh, somewhat disappointed that the courts put a hold on the latest gun legislation? Uh, you can start, Assembly Member. That, uh, uh, which piece of legislation? Uh, it was... Um, uh, Assemblyman, you, you're familiar with this too. The, the, uh, we passed legislation uh, in, uh, on to July 1st. Back off on, uh, on. In reaction to the Supreme Court's overruling a 100 year old law. That's right. I'm sorry. It was the concealed, concealed, concealed yeah. carry. Concealed carry. And the, um, and the courts put a stop to it. Do you <coughs> anticipate, either of you, do you anticipate it being overturned? Uh, First uh, assembly okay, member. I mean, Fernandez? I think it's going to depend on the results of this election um, and see who might be pushing for it. Um, but I don't anticipate it to be overturned again. I think that, you know, there is as much as states uh, around the country are not taking proper steps to curb gun control uh, and to stop gun violence. I do think that that will hold. Um, Mr. Zakari, your thoughts on crime and, and what you've seen and what needs to be done to uh, get back to a point where uh, people are walking down the streets afraid. I mean, Gary, look. When I talk to my neighbors and I'm out on the streets and I'm, I'm listening to what people have to say, quality of life and public safety is one of the top issues um, that, that are concerned to my community. And it's a concern to me as a member of the community who has a family. Um, I think that the, the legislation that the state legislature proposed was, was something that was much needed. And Wh which led the bail reform? Yes, because I think we need to understand that, you know, not just, on, not just where we went on guns, but where we went in, the in reforming the criminal justice system as a whole, right? I think we need to understand that oftentimes um, people ignore the root causes of the issues because we can't help but focus on what the, the, the visible symptoms are. Um, and I think that the importance, and look, what I look forward to doing as an assembly member when I go to Albany is to make sure that I'm sitting with my colleagues in the legislature, I'm sitting down with the speaker and making sure um, that we're looking at real life data, that we're working with organizations who are on the ground working to address crime in our communities and figure out what it is we need to do to start tackling the root causes of this crime wave. Uh, the, the, the balance, uh, I think, that is questioned very often is whether or not we need to put more funding for um, police and criminal justice solutions or more funding, uh, an assembly member talked about uh, funding community organizations and those kinds of things that are preventative. How do you see that, that equation? I think, I think we need both, right? I think we need a holistic approach. I, it was once said that we can both have safety and have justice at the same time, right? And the city council, I was, I was uh, very, you know, it was critical that we worked with a lot of cure violence programs that were the inter intervention and the violence disruptors in our community. But we need to make sure that we are increasing funding um, to make sure that we're supporting these young people and give, giving them the services and the critical services that they need to keep them off the streets and keep them entertained. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we, we are addressing this issue on a holistic approach. It's not just cops. We need more cops on our street. That's a, that's, that's a given. And I think folks want more cops on the street. Uh, we need to figure out how we do that while making sure we're putting the funding that we need for prevention programs um, to making sure that we're working with cops and community on addressing this issue together. In your introductory statement, you talked about inflation and talk about the rise of prices. Gas and grocery prices are on the rise. Polls say they are fueling, no pun intended, uh, a uh, resurgence in uh, Republican support. Um, yes, it's largely a national issue, uh, but what can be done at the state level to address uh, the rise of prices and the frustration that I think all of us feel 
uh, when we walk into the store. Yeah, I mean, look, Gary, I think you said it right and in terms of the it, where this falls on the federal side. Um, and look, as somebody as a first time candidate who's going to be going to Albany, I mean, I look forward to sitting down with many of the people who are experts on this issue and figuring out how we can get it addressed. Um, but on the local level, on the community side, we need to figure out how we're investing more in economic development, getting people back to work, supporting businesses um, that have that have, have really fallen through the cracks as a, as a and in this time of the You're pandemic. About small business, small businesses. You know, we need to make sure that we're providing them the supports that they need and looking and finding those who really took deep impacts during during the pandemic and figuring out how we keep those businesses alive while creating economic opportunity uh, for people in our community. Assemblyman Dinowitz, I recall your enthusiasm for the state budget when we did a program after uh, the budget was passed. Um, Republicans are saying there's fat in it. Uh, they point to that $850 million giveaway, if you will, uh, to the uh, Buffalo Bills Stadium. Uh, have the Democrats gone spend crazy? I mean, uh, is it just out of control and as a result it's uh, costing taxpayers uh, in the wrong way? The only thing out of control is the extremist rhetoric of the Trumper Republicans, in my opinion. We passed a great budget. We are funding to a larger extent than ever uh, education, uh, child care, important priorities uh, that we have to address in our state. So I've, I've seen more than a few budgets and I, I'm certain that this is the best budget we've passed. I know that some people have you know, pointed to the Buffalo Bills thing, but you know what? A budget is a, a compromise among the Senate, the governor, and the assembly. And every, each of the three have their own priorities. And we got our priorities in the budget. And in order to get, you gotta give a little. I didn't like that Buffalo Bills thing myself, but we got so much money for our kids. And it's not just the child care and the education, it's so many other priorities that we dealt with in the budget. And I would say that those who said you should have, and one of, in the primary campaign, my opponent said uh, she would have voted against that uh, bill where, where all that stuff was in. I said, well, if you vote against the, uh, the, the budget bill that had the Buffalo bills in it, you were also voting to cut schools. You were also voting to cut child care and every one of those other priorities. So any budget bill that we ever vote on, yeah, there's going to be some stuff we don't like, but our job is to get as many good things as possible, the things that our constituents and the people of the state need. Assembly Member Fernandez, I recall when you were sitting in that same seat and we did a debate uh, before the primary, you talked a lot about small businesses and uh, Mr. Zaccaro uh, already um, mentioned the notion of supporting small businesses. What do they really need and how will or can this affect the local economies so that when people walk into the grocery store or shop just about anywhere, uh, they, they can get a better price point? Well, we have so many great entrepreneurs and uh, authentic small businesses here in the Bronx and all over the city and the state, and they need support. So um, the MWBE system, we need to fix the backlog. Uh, right now, there are thousands of applicants waiting for that certification, and that certification is very helpful. It, it brings them... Um, awareness to grants and loans and programs and, and any type of assistance that the state is doing at the moment, you get first knowledge of it. So it's important that we uh, make sure that people have that certification so they're already at that level. Now for our small businesses, you know, again, authentic, very unique businesses that maybe get products from uh, domestically or internationally. And the taxes that comes with bringing those products into the, our neighborhoods is costing small businesses a lot. So I want to look at the formula to see why we are hurting our small businesses more than helping. Um, and then looking at commercial rents, like I do think that we need some sort of uh, rent freeze or control on what the commercial rents are because right now some storefronts are forced to pay tens of thousands of dollars to stay open. So for our small businesses, we need to encourage more to grow, uh, create better uh, paths to stability so they can stay for generations. You know, we just had Conti's make its 100th birthday this year. So I want to see that for every small business. But they need support. It, I, I guess the, the scary thing in what um, uh, the other side is saying is you keep spending money. Can these, you talked about systemic things that can be done. Is, is that how you see it? Or do you think there is funding, there are tax breaks, and there are other things that ultimately would cost money for the state? In other words, how do, how do, how do you balance that out so that you don't end up costing the state money at the same time you're trying to 
you know, um, spur on small business? Well, every member ha wants to do the most for, uh, you know, their, their niche, their passion, their focus, their community, their constituents. And yes, sometimes it costs money. And no, we don't want to raise the taxes, especially on working families. But there have been proposals and options that I think we should look at and really take a, a, a chance with, like taxing the ultra billionaires. Someone the other day was telling me, why would you support that, uh, taxing the billionaires? You know, that's, um, what would I say? Either way, my argument is, why are you so concerned about the billionaires' uh, protection when they really don't care about you? And if I'm paying 30,000 or 30 percent of uh, my income in taxes, why can't the ultra billionaire pay 30 percent of their income in taxes? I think it's just talking about fairness in what we give back to the state um, because there are needs. There are great, great needs. And one of the investments that we did pass this year for small businesses was the seeding fund. The seeding fund helped some small businesses that right before the pandemic were already backed up on um, water bills, uh, electricity bills, renovations, repair costs, whatever. Um, the pandemic stopped all that, but now they're in bigger debt than before. So we created $200 million available in grants for small businesses so they could catch up and not be in the, the debt that they've been sunken in for so long and get back to a level where they can jump off and back into their business. And of course, uh, small business owners, uh, many of them come from the community, so you're helping those uh, families as well. Uh, yes. You and I both uh, attended a uh, real estate uh, legislative breakfast um, uh, last week, and um, the, the talk seem to keep going back to affordable housing. Now, you've had some challenges and controversies in your assembly district. It would still be in your senatorial district. Um, where are we at as far as building affordable housing? Obviously, homelessness is through the roof. We've uh, At least the tide has been stemmed somewhat now for the migrant crisis. It doesn't appear that we're getting 10 buses a day like we were getting. Um, but the need is great. Uh, how does a, a state senator, if you are elected to the Senate, uh, help that situation so that we can build more affordable housing, maybe convert vacancies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that uh, people can afford to live in, in the borough of the Bronx? Well, we do need more housing, and we need to make available the housing that is in the community and in the state already. Uh, we've had proposals to create uh, ADUs, adult dwelling units, solidifying and officiating that now you have an apartment in your home uh, before basement apartments were illegal once before now we want to make them legal again basically that's going to open up a uh, new housing stock the vacant apartments that we know are out there landlords are struggling to vac to renovate them so we need to see how we can create uh, accessibility to that change and that renovation so then the tenants have accessibility to the vacant apartment um, and average rent of course is always going up and it's been fluctuating for years and I ask everyone to flip the ballot over because there is a proposal on the back of the ballot that would look at the income of our communities and what it really is mm -hmm. um, and that's been a long time problem that the average income where we base rents on does not match the actual average income so I, I don't, I don't want to spend I think a lot of time on it, but I'm just curious. Were you disappointed that the city council approved uh, that Bruckner rezoning? And uh, what are your thoughts about the Just Home project that is still being uh, discussed? Um, a little disappointed because the, that community, uh, the, the down zoning of it uh, was intentional to keep diversity in New York City. You know, yes, we have our communities that are very dense with sky, sky high buildings, but we're also proud to have our communities that are just residential homes. And like I said, there is housing options within these communities that we need to really bring out of the woodwork. Um, and I'm just afraid that, you know, it's going to open the door to skyscrapers in Throg's Neck. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's going to take a lot of monitoring and, and management by the elected leaders uh, to make sure that, you know, we don't get to that level. But more housing is always good. Mr. Zaccaro, you mentioned uh, affordable housing is something that was high on your priority list. Let's talk about if you are elected to the assembly, how you would address it. Look, Gary, as a young person grown look i was born and raised by a single mother and i faced housing insecurity as a young person and so i understand how important it is to make sure um that we're providing people a safe and 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 quality housing um and look working for the land use chair at the city council has been one of my greatest pleasures um to work and see how the legislature works in terms of creating these opportunities for people you know in the south bronx in the last seven years you know council member salamanca has been able to bring in eight thousand units of affordable housing um and i've been a part 
part of that work and seeing how we're really creating opportunities for people um, and turning some of these communities around. But not just affordable housing, but we also need to figure out how we bring in affordable home ownership. Um, you know, we're encouraging our kids to go to school to get, genetic, get an education and get a good job, uh, but we're not providing them the opportunity that when they come back from college and they come back and get that good paying job, we're not providing them with opportunity to stay in their community and to keep their money and spending into the community that they've been born and raised in. And so I look forward to working and figuring out how on the state level we can create more opportunities. Assemblyman Dinowitz, let's uh, evaluate uh, the notion of affordable housing in your community. Many people say, well, he's a Riverdale assembly member, but of course the district is much broader than that. Um, talk about affordable housing and um, what do you hear in your office uh, from constituents. We had one assembly member at that legislative breakfast who said nine out of ten calls I get are people saying I need a place to live. What have, what's your experience on it? And then, of course, what do you do if you are reelected? Well, you know, there are two sides. Number one, every time I see another building going up to replace a single family home, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that that has a negative impact on the community. But on the other hand, we are in desperate need of housing. We want to keep people in their homes. As you know, I was the author of the eviction moratorium, which uh, prevented people from being evicted for over a year during uh, the pandemic. But that's over with now. But the housing crisis, I believe, is exacerbated by many of the property owners in the city. I'm talking about the big landlords. It was reported recently that over 60,000 rent-stabilized units are vacant, and I think the number from what I've heard is more like 80,000. Why is it that 60 to 80,000 rent-stabilized units are vacant? And I would suggest that it's not because they can't rent them, but it's, it's, they're creating a crisis or they're contributing to a crisis. Uh, they, they would love to end the rent stabilization system altogether. We have fought tooth and nail in the legislature three years ago. Uh, Assemblywoman and I and others worked. We passed major uh, legislation to uh, put, swing the pendulum back in favor of tenants in terms of, uh, of the rent protection laws. Uh, but we do need more housing, no question. Uh, I think the uh, I wish we can replicate the Mitchell Lama program, which I know you and I are very familiar with. That was one of the most successful housing programs, if not the most successful, that New York has ever had. Uh, but I do think when housing is being built, we want, on the one hand want to create incentives for developers to include affordable housing, but on the other hand, we don't want to give away the store. And that was the problem with 421A. It gave away the store to them. Does the migrant crisis make you take a second look at that um problem that you said, this notion of replacing um, you know, single family homes with larger buildings that you say, well, you know what, people are going to need a place to live. Has it changed some of your thinking on, on how to develop a community? It, it has not. Um, I think ultimately uh, the, the, the migrants that have come will not necessarily settle exclusively in New York City. Some of them may uh, you know, go elsewhere, upstate. I mean, there are some who've suggested that upstate can actually use more people. The workforce is in desperate need, so it will be a perfect match. But some of them will. We have a number of migrants uh, in my district, asylum seekers, uh, at some of the schools in my district. And of course, the community, the outpouring of support for them has been really heartwarming because I think people understand that this country, we should not be turning away people the way the United States did in the 1930s, where people People died because of it, and uh, we we just have to deal with it now and uh, and be welcoming. Assemblymember Fernandez, I recall uh, at that that debate um, when I think when we summarized the debate and I asked you what are your priorities, one of the uh, things you said was uh, the environment and uh, infrastructure. Uh, last week, the mayor unveiled a plan to build a wall on the Lower East Side uh, to prevent against uh, potential um, storm surges, uh, which we had for Hurricane Sandy, of course. In uh, the East Bronx, uh, the, the chances are much more significant uh, in both City Island and Throgs Neck and other places. The Environmental Bond Act that's on the ballot would provide, that's another one that people have to flip their ballot to read, uh, would provide $4.2 billion of infrastructure support. Is this the best, as a bond act, what we need? Is there something um, more uh, within the legislative budget? Uh, just talk about financing it that doesn't break the banks of the state, break the, the, the pocketbook of uh, the state of New York. 
Uh, it's absolutely a need. We've been fighting for this for years, even before I've been in the legislature. So to get to this point where we have literally the, the power to bring that money to our communities, making it available, is very much needed because, yes, that will give us the, the, in, the investment to update infrastructure. We're seeing flooding every day with every rainstorm. We need to redo all our sewer systems. We're seeing that, yes, flooding is, is hurting our coastal communities. We need to provide... Um, resilience opportunity for them to upgrade their homes if they have to. Some homes literally lifting off of the ground to prepare for this. Um, and a seawall I think is helpful and I believe there is a seawall uh, on the east side over in the district. So let's see how well that, that lasts and for how long because the, I think the crisis is moving faster than we anticipate. We're, we're almost out of time. Is that what that $4.2 billion is for? Do you see that as going? People of City Island from Throgs Neck who are very concerned can say now there'll be funding to help us out. I would say That's so. I would fight for that. Let, let's um, just uh, give you each a, a chance just to summarize. Um, we'll go down the <laughs> row again. Mr. Zaccaro, uh, if people have a choice and they do have a choice in this um, come upcoming election, uh, why should they think of you and uh, the Democrats uh, as they go to the voting booth? Thank you again, Gary. And look, as I mentioned before, um, now more than ever, we are finding ourselves in a place where we are facing critical issues in our community. Um, and we need people who have experience. We need people who have the leadership to get it done and know how to get it done. Um, I've been a public servant my entire adult life and I look forward to continuing to serve my community in this capacity and making sure how I can continue to elevate my community and amplify the voices and the concerns that matter to them most. Um, I'm not just someone that's talked about the work and I'm the one that's been doing the work and I look forward to continuing that work in the state legislature should I be elected. Assemblyman, it's probably not the first time I've asked you this question, but a, a similar question for you. Why do you think people should say, well, um, considering the options, maybe I ought to vote for Jeff Dinowitz? Well, I have an opponent on my way far right, an opponent on my far left, but most people know the work that I've done. Uh, I've, I've lived in the Bronx all my life. I've lived in this district by, uh, virtually my entire life, and I've been active in my community since I was a teenager, um, and I love what I do. I love helping people. I love strengthening our community. Um, I've, I've passed more laws in Albany each year than most of my colleagues, um, and, and I know most of them work very hard. Um, I've, uh, my constituent service operation in the district is incredible. Um, and if there's one thing people can say about me is that no matter where they are, no matter what thing is going on in my district, I'm there. I'm involved in everything. Thank you. Um, why, why should you move from the Assembly to the Senate? Over the last 10 years, I've been a public service to, a servant to the East Bronx. It's been the honor of my life and a real passion that I have to see the change, uh, big or small, be possible. Um, and moving on to this role, please know to my community that you will st still have the same leader that you've had, the same friend, neighbor, uh, constituent uh, in the neighborhood to listen, to deliver, and to fight for you. And my community knows that I've been that person, reliable when they need them, uh, listening when they want them to, and showing up when they ask. And I think that steadiness, that reliable uh, presence of, of a senator, of a community leader, of a partner, is what you'll get from me. Got it. John Zaccaro, Jr., thank you very much. Thank Jeffrey. You. Dinowitz, thank you. Natalia Fernandez, thank you. And before we leave tonight, we want to thank our producers, Rebecca Hemick and Stephen Powell. Our director is Benaya War. The cast of thousands who are working in the control room and in the studio here, and to you, the people of the Bronx. With a reminder, Election Day is coming up November 8th. Early voting has begun. Absentee ballots must be marked by November 7th and received by November 15th. We'll see you next week with a program about affordable housing. Good night.